Hello, welcome to the table. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mott Windle. And we're doing my continuation of my top 30 games of all time. So do watch the previous video if you've not seen that. That's um, games from sort of 30 down to 21. So in this video, part two, we're doing 20 down to 11. So um, anything else to add? Or uh, should we launch straight in? I'm just looking forward to the excess of Euro games you sent me <laughs> in this year. Oh, that's true. I did mention there's been a surprising amount. So... The only real shot last time was the uh, Lord of the Rings LCG moving on. So is there going to be more shocks? Down. Yeah, is there going to be there gonna be more shocks in this one, or is it going to be? There is one particular shock. At least it was for me when I <laughs> discovered my list. Okay, because I didn't really plan out my list too much. I was just like, yeah, I prefer this game to this game. I want to play this one more than this one. And then I looked at my list and went, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So yeah, there's a couple of those. We'll have a look. Number 20. So we're kicking off with a Euro, and this one is a heavy Euro called Agra, which um, came out, well, it was Essen last year, wasn't it? So uh, we've been playing it most of the year, and is it not, was it not Essen? Yes, mate. It was. So it's um, it, themed in India, and I really like the artwork, I should say. It's a very colourful board, and it's... Um, a kind of worker placement game. You've got tons and tons of actions all over the board. Effectively, you're gathering resources in various ways and cashing them in for points. It's quite distinctive to look at because it has this sort of board that goes up at an angle. Well, perhaps pop a picture of this on top of the video. Um, but the few things that I like about it, apart from the fact that, like many heavy euros, there's a lot of different interconnected mechanics. One really nice thing is this meditation idea. So you can go where somebody else is and then you knock them off. That's right, don't mm. they? and they kind of get a small benefit, like an extra resource for being knocked off. Um, but when your guys are stood there, if, you, if they manage to survive and not get knocked off, then you can spend an action to meditate with them. And they all lie down, <laughs> meditate, <laughs> and then you have this extra little ingenious action section where you can pick one of the actions and then the disc kind of moves across, doesn't it? And you pick other actions, but there's always one action you can't pick because of the disc covers it up, if you like. So this extra meditation thing, using your workers that you've already used, as long as they survive long enough, I really liked. Um, it does lots of Euro things really well. You know, it's very tight. Uh, it's quite a long game. You need to be prepared for that. Um, but I've just had a blast with this. Played it quite a lot this year and still very happy to play it again. We'll give it a go next time we're in. Yeah, I like this game. I think it's roughly in the same position as it was on my list. My mm, in the okay. high teens, I think. Uh, yeah, it's great. It is very thinky. You can play this with someone who's slow and you'll have a very slow game, but I, I've had that most a lot of the time anyway, and I still enjoy it. Yeah, that's true. It, it's long because people take a long time thinking, but I'm always engaged all the way through. Yeah, I think I have some peace in this one. I really like the, the resource trade thing, I think is as good as any resource trade thing in any Euro game. I'm less keen on the competition on going up the sideboard thing. Yeah, uh, okay. But, uh, but it's a very, very solid Euro. Number 19. Now, rather strangely, I didn't plan it out, it just sort of fell this way. My next game is also another Euro themed in India, and that's Rajas of the Ganges, um, which I do prefer just a smidge to Agra. Um, it has lots of really nice mechanisms as well in this one. Uh, one thing I really like about it is you've got money, a money track around the outside, which tracks um, how much you, money you've got. But then there's another track that goes in the opposite direction, which is the victory point track. And the way you win the game is to get the amount of money you've got on this track to cross over the amount of victory point you've got on the other track. So when they go past each other, that kind of ends the game and you win. If two people kind of do it on the same round, it's the person who got them to cross the furthest. And I've never seen that before. And it's really interesting. And it means you can just go kind of all out for money and try and get loads and loads of money in the game. Or you can try and get all out for victory points. Or you can do a bit of both. And I've seen people win with a variety of different strategies. I've seen people just go for money and manage to win, despite they had the fact that they had hardly any victory points. The money got so far. In fact, you always do very well mm. with this. <laughs> you will not always beat me. <laughs> uh, a few other nice things, though. I mean, again, you're, you have a player board in front of you where you're placing tiles. So you have workers, again, which are dice in this game, and you're placing them to take actions, but you're also kind of building up this little route of, of tiles on your board and you can kind of acquire markets which get you the money or you get these nice Indian buildings that get you victory points uh, but there's a trade-off it's like am I better getting more money or getting more victory point buildings and I really like that uh, there's a nice little river track up the middle as well which is kind of separate from everything else 
but gives you extra bonus type actions as you move further and further up the river. It's lots of comboing actions, uh, triggering one thing off another thing. Uh, it does a great job, and I always have a blast playing this one. I like it, I bought it. Um, I really like the crossing of the track. Yeah. You, 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 doesn't, you, you don't necessarily know which person's ahead at any point in the game. Yes. Um, so someone's got loads of money, but you know that you've got 10 VPs coming next to and VPs are worth more than money because VP will move you two spaces. As, yeah, so there aren't as many spaces on the VP track, are there? So um, one space is further. Yeah. I just am um, not as big a fan of it as you. I don't, mm. I don't know why. It um, surprises me. I think there's a dominant strategy or stra two strategies. It feels like that mix half and half, I don't see anyone win that way. You think you've got to optimise one or the other and one. do enough to... Okay. I think if you're the only one going for the markets and you always get to take that good market action in the middle, you get lots of money. That's true. It is mm -hmm. one of those games that if you're the only one going down one strategy, you're going to do very well. It's kind of funny because a lot of games you talk about um, how there's multiple paths to victory. I mean, this is one of the few where it's quite clear on the board yeah. there are different paths. You need money in VPs yeah. and that's it. But yeah. I think you've just... And, Doing a strategy that makes you more efficient at getting money is clearly stronger than doing a strategy that makes you get points and stuff and money for everything. Yeah. Okay. It's just my opinion. I, was, I thought I'd like it. I wasn't as enamoured with it as other people. So with it being Dice Placement, I think I enjoyed it more as well. But I think I like Dice Placement. That game's like, I'm sure you might hear that to Marco Polo and stuff. I like that sort of thing more so than a, a straight worker placement game, I think now. At the moment, anyway. Yeah. I think it's great. Number 18. Steve was just joking in the intermission there uh, that my next one's a heavy euro, but it's not. This has got lots of theme. Um, arrived on Kickstarter just a few weeks ago, and that's Western Legends, which is a Wild West theme game. And it's a sandbox game, essentially. So you take a cowboy uh, or an Indian and you effectively run around town, or you can sort of travel out of town to uh, the uh, the farm, what do you call farms? In Ranches. Ranches. The ranch. Uh, you can go to the train station. So you can kind of um, wrangle cattle, I think they call it, or you can actually rustle the cattle and sort of carry it somewhere else, not where it's meant to go. Uh, you can become an outlaw and rob the bank. Uh, you can become a sheriff or a marshal, I think they call it, and run around trying to arrest the people who just robbed the bank. Um, there's various bandits running around town generally. You can play cards. There's everything you think you want to be able to do in the Western you can do in this game. And it's very freeform. It's your turn. You can just decide to go wherever you want and do whatever you like. Uh, one really nice thing about it is the card play. So the way combat works and the way quite a lot of other things work in the game is you have a hand of cards and they're like playing card cards. So you've got your sort of jacks, queens, kings and aces and things. But each card has a special ability as well. So in a fight, each of you effectively just plays one card and the highest card wins. Except that... The special abilities might modify it. Um, so for example, you might play a low card, so you're pretty much guaranteed to lose, but it does extra wounds to your opponent. Um, or you might play, uh, generally the higher the cards, the less good the abilities are. So sometimes you might be quite happy losing a fight because you, you want to get the special ability. So uh, there's a nice bit of um, mitigating and kind of decision making in terms of when do you save your best cards, which fights do you really want to win, things like that. Uh, and obviously, when you're going to the saloon to play cards, you can actually play the cards as part of a poker hand, if you're playing hands of poker for that. So it combines lots of things really well. It feels like quite an old-fashioned game. You know, it, it's not quite roll and move, but effectively, oh, it's my turn, I'm going to go dop, 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 and I'm going to take an action here, and everyone else kind of sits and waits. But I find it so engrossing, so thematic, that I didn't really mind. You know, I played a sort of full four-player game, and it's not too long, actually, um, but I just enjoyed the adventure. Even if it's not your turn, you're kind sort of interested to see what's going to happen when he, when the bandit who's just robbed the bank faces off against one of the marshals. It's just fun. So I've had a blast with this one. I don't think either of you have played it though. <laughs> no, no. Sounds like your cup of tea. Yes. Um, you I, hate it. <laughs> I don't know. Like, so I, I don't think it's a game I'd want to go and play, but I like the idea of... I, I mean, <clears throat> again, it's not a game I really like necessarily, but I really like what it's trying to do. Is the Legends of a Drifter system? Mm. Yeah. You can go wherever you want and do whatever you want yeah. within the context of the rules of the game. And obviously this is more thematic than Zio, I guess. So maybe it's actually for those yeah. people who like, you know, shooting people. Just, you know, you know, you don't have to, like in Zio, you don't have to attack people. Yes, that's right. So here you don't yeah. have to do that. You can just deliver stuff. Yeah. And it's the same in this. Yeah. So I like that. I like what that game's trying to do. It definitely draws people in. And uh, But yeah, they're not my sort of 
It's the best Western I've ever played. You know, I don't think any <laughs> other game has come close to simulating what it feels like to be in a Western. So if that appeals to you, I highly recommend it. Number 17. Now, the next game is technically a replacement. Um, last year, I had Nurashima Hex on my list, um, which I really, really like, and I played far more on the app than anything else. Um, but this year, uh, Monolith Arena came out, which is effectively the sequel to Nurashima Hex. And I should say, it's very, very similar. Um, they've just added this one extra mechanism, the Monolith, as well as new factions and things. Um, but that makes it a slightly better game, but it was, it was a great game before, so um, I'm really enjoying this one. It's, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's like an abstract war game. It's played on a kind of small hex map, and on your turn you're kind of drafting uh, units uh, from a sort of faction of stack. You kind of draw three and pick two to play, and you can put units on various bases on the hex anywhere you like on the map. And other hexes that you play will have special abilities, so it might add one to the initiative or one to the combat strength or something. But the key idea is once the map fills up, or if somebody plays an attack card, only at that point does everything fight. And it all kind of fights, not quite simultaneously, but like I was saying, they've got initiative. So everything that's got initiative three shoots or hits first, and then everything that's got initiative two shoots or hits afterwards. That's still alive. That's right. So there might be your guy who was really hoping he's going to hit gets killed off by a fast-acting unit. Um, with three initiative. So I really like that interplay. You really need to think ahead. It's uh, quite a thinky game. You can see the game, hmm, okay, if I do this, he's going to do that. And you're trying to trace through the various order of attacks. And then someone plays another tile and it keeps, it changes everything. You're like, oh, I'm going to have to rethink this. Um, but if you like abstract games, this is the most thematic abstract game I've ever played. Uh, so much so it doesn't feel abstract to me. I think I had maybe one abstract game earlier on this list. Um, but this one is fantastic. You need to like that kind of heavy, thinky game, but it does its job really well. The monolith, I should say, is like a little stack of three units which are sort of hidden, and on your turn, you can kind of expand the monolith so it kind of goes like one, two, and then the three units are all out there, and so you suddenly fill up an amount of space really quickly, so which means your opponent can think the battle's not about to be triggered anytime soon, there's still like three or four spaces left, but then you kind of play a unit, expand your monolith, and suddenly you fill up the unit and combat happens. And then after the combat, it kind of contracts and goes back in again. So it also means you can hide units in there so your opponent doesn't know necessarily what units are going to be in your monolith. You kind of pre-plan those at the start of the game. So if you like Nirashima Hex, I'd highly recommend this. I do think it's a better game. Is this game where you can you can pre-sort your deck or deck of cards beforehand? Can you edit it? No, you can't. Um, it's a fixed faction, effectively, okay. that comes with a stack, and you just shuffle the entire lot, and then you start picking randomly. And then of those stack, at the start of the game, you can choose which ones go in your monolith. That's right. Uh, so, in fact, you can look through the entire deck beforehand to decide which ones to put in your monolith. Then you shuffle them all up and start drawing yeah. for the actual match. But there's several different factions in the game, and each faction feels very different in terms of special abilities and things, which is nice. The weird thing is, as you were describing this, you were describing all the good things about an abstract game, and yet you, <laughs> you repeatedly say you hate abstracts. Is it the theme that does it for you? Because I don't think there's too much theme. The factions are really well done. Okay. The artwork's great, and you're right. You could just replace this with a completely unthematic... Yeah, you could have Basically. the king is initiative three, a queen is initiative yeah, three, whatever, that's right. and, you know, chess pieces. And... and as soon as you start saying that, I really start to lose interest. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I've got orcs or whatever it is, and this orc's right. got big spikes on his shoulders, I don't know, it kind of gets me into it. <clears throat> are the special abilities of the individual units, or are there many like status effects that I remember there being in Nirishima, which had quite a few in... Yeah, um, there's quite a lot that they can do. So there's some units that, like, capture other mm -hmm. units, like there's a net thing that just freezes them, which means they can't act. Um, as you say, there's some that make other units go earlier on, there's some that can kind of teleport effectively to other places on the board, so there's quite a lot of variety within a fairly simple rule mm. set. That's the other thing, it's very easy to teach. It's um, difficult to know how to do well, but you can teach the game very quickly. I suppose like most good... That is like, exactly how I would describe <laughs> entropy. That was the thing. Entropy, here you go, it's very easy to teach, yeah. it's very hard to do well, but you can... Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, it's weird. So if you don't like abstracts because they lack theme, then I'd highly recommend Monolith Arena. Number 16. 
This next one we've done quite a few videos for really uh, recently, sorry. It's um, been our flavour of the month, I think, and it's one where we never quite figure out what the name should be. Uh, originally it was released in German called Ganz schön clever, and I think the English title is pretty darn clever, but we can't seem to get hold of the English version. For love nor money. So we've been playing the German version, haven't we? It's a roll and write, and it's the best roll and write I've ever played, as we keep saying. Um, so there's no theme on this one, but for some reason it still really draws me in. Effectively on your turn you're rolling a bunch of coloured dice and each turn you're picking one of these dice to use on a sheet and you write in. You either write the number of the dice in the sheet or you just put across an appropriate area. There's different coloured areas on the sheet that correspond to the different colours of the dice. And you're just trying to fill in like rows and columns or sort of um, add up the numbers to get points in different areas. But the beauty of it is that when you fill up certain rows or certain columns, it triggers extra numbers you can write in elsewhere or extra crosses you can put in other sections. So you get this kind of cascade chain of extra actions or numbers that you can write in, which is really satisfying when it happens. Um, the other great benefit to it is that when someone else is taking the turn, you get to use one of the dice that they don't use. So you're kind of invested on other people's turns because um, you're like, oh, I'm really hoping he doesn't use the orange dice. I really need an orange dice for this or something. Um, so it keeps you involved and it's nice and quick. Um, I think it's a great package and I've really enjoyed playing it. We've played it a lot this mm. year. Played it a lot online as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good. Uh, I've been thinking about all the Roland rights I do like and it is either everyone's got choice from the same things or mm. you've got a choice in someone else's turn. Yeah. I think that is a very strong part of it because Yahtzee is just... There's a lot of time sitting around doing That's nothing. That's right, you just sat waiting for your turn to come around, aren't you? Yeah. But yeah, I agree with Jonathan, it's my favourite role right ever too. It would be, it's most like a Feld game. As I said <laughs> previously, just the way that there's so much, so many routes to scoring and comboing, and so yeah, yeah it's definitely in your ball park. Number 15. The next one is yet another Euro. And this is one I played at Essen. We got through the first round of the game or something, and then it was like the end of the day and they had to stop, but I went and bought it immediately. I fell in love with the game. And that's Gugong, which is kind of Chinese themed this time. Uh, so there's a bit of building the Great Wall of China. You're kind of traveling around on part of the board. Um, but the main action, which uh, the main, sorry, mechanism in this in terms of choosing actions uh, is with a hand of cards. And when it's your turn, you place a card on one of the action spots that might let you do some traveling or some building or something uh, and you have to swap it with the one that's there but the card you play has to be a higher number. The numbers go from 1 to 9 so if there's a 4 on a particular spot I have to play a card higher than 4. Now you might think eventually that's going to get up to a 9 and how you play higher than 9. If you have a 1 you can play it on top of a 9. Nothing else beats a 9 but effectively the 1 lets you wrap round again. So on your turn, you're thinking about you know which are the best cards to play in the different places. It's got to be higher though, but also the card potentially gives you an action, as well as having an action space there. And the lower the number on the card, usually the better the action on the card. So when you swap the card, the card you pick up kind of goes into a discard pile for next turn. So the difficult decisions all the way through this is, I really want to get good cards, but good cards can sometimes be low cards because the actions are really good, but it's really hard to play the low cards because you've got to play higher than the previous card that was on there. So there's so much to think about. I mean, essentially you're gathering resources and gaining points like many Euros. Um, there's a nice little shipping track down the bottom, which effectively allows you to unlock a couple of special abilities, which I really like. So a lot of the actions require you to kind of spend workers. You use these little cubes um, and there's this one extra ability you can unlock, which is a double worker which means when you need to, two workers, you can spend it as a single worker, but with the various ways of getting workers back, and you, when you get one worker, you can take your double worker back. So it's like you're spending it for two, but getting it for one, so it's double the value if you like. And there's a couple of other really nice special abilities in there, but that whole mechanism of card play is super thinky. It can be quite AP prone analysis paralysis if you're not careful. It, games can take a long time if people get a bit stuck with it. But that's the thing that I really like about it. It's super engaging because there's so much to think about with the interconnected. I want the high cards, but I want the low cards, but I want this action, but no, this action on the cards better, which goes here and ah. <laughs> I love it. How do you get down with it? I don't think it's necessarily AP. I think everyone's slow. It's not like someone with AP will slow the game down. It's like everyone slows the game down. Okay, because there's so much to At the start of your mm. turn, you have to reassess everything, I feel. Yes, okay. Because the cards could easily change on the board, yeah. especially in the places person, you want to go. If they've just taken the spot you've got, well, you re you've got to go through all those options that you were going through 
again because that's got spot gone. Or if they go somewhere where you go, oh, that gives me another option. I now do need to reassess the one I was going to take or that one. Um, plus everything you've talked about. One thing I really like about that is the middle track. That if you don't get to the top of <laughs> the <laughs> emperor track, yeah, or whatever it might be, you can't win the game. In fact, not only can you not win the game, your score will be zero. Um, so the, the one game I've played, and I think it's an excellent game, the one game I've played, Mark and I got to the top of that track early, so we could spend the last round doing the stuff that got us points, and Jonathan and the fourth player in the game just like spent the whole last round fretting and fretting, trying to get to the top of this track, and then just, they just didn't get the points they needed to. Did um, I get up in the end? Or did no, I? We, all get, we all got there. But you, you I wasted so much time, yeah, didn't I, at the end? Did. And the problem is, there's a couple of actions you can spend, which makes it more expensive for other people to take yes. actions. So these guys were both making the Emperor track <laughs> yeah. more expensive. And I was like, oh, but it's so expensive to go up the track, but I need to go up the track. I can't get no points at all. <laughs> yeah, it's very clever. It's quite like the, also the game around the top and pick all the bonus tiles that give you random effects. You can yeah. throw, throw openings that you didn't expect. And also, is it the crunch you get? But essentially, you look at the end of your round, you see what cards you got, and you're matching some dice at the top, yeah, which right. can be adjusted during the round if you want to do all the people in. And then that gives you more, is it the currency? The workers, the, yeah, the workers yeah. back. Yeah, which yeah. is another course. So you like, not only you care about the next round just for the cards you're available, like think of RAR or something like that. It's also, I want more workers and stuff. So yeah. there is so much to every card, every placement's so important. But as you say, that does slow it down a little bit because the thinking involved is... It's a lot more than just a lot of, a lot of games of that ilk. Didn't, it didn't put me off, No the thinking. It, I, I, I would count it as a negative, but it was not off-putting. Yeah, that's true. Because in some games... Because I was thinking too. When they were thinking, I was mm, still thinking. Yes. You can, be, you can come up with a, like a plan B or a plan C in some games. And then if somebody changes this or changes that, it's like, okay, well, I'll just go with my plan B or my plan C. Mm. But in this one, when it changes it, it creates so many different possibilities. Mm. The problem is like, oh, but this has a knock-on effect for this, which has a knock-on effect for that. Oh, I'm going to have to rethink everything. But yeah, it's, I was planning to put my... I was going to go there, but he's put these cards there. Well, my four was going to go there later. Well, my four can't go there. Where can my four go? Well, I might have to play it now before. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it might not have been the action you were planning to do or wanting to do, but you just have to do it. Yeah. Number 14. This next one, I think, was in my top 10 last year, so it's dropped a little bit. Uh, and I'm trying to work out why. I think it's just because I've played it quite a lot, and uh, you'll probably hear Steve mention that it's quite a similar game each time you play it, and that's Scythe. It's a fantastic game, I think. Uh, essentially, it's a big, looks like a kind of dudes on a map game, because each player gets these big mechs, which they use to kind of stomp around the land. Um, but actually, it's far more of a Euro, and the thing that really draws me into it, apart from the theme, which is fantastic, it's kind of set, it's like alternative... Twitches, uh, yeah. that sort of... Like cyberpunk rock, what? no, it's not... Steampunk. Like... Steampunk, Steampunk, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the artwork's fantastic, but what I really like is the, the kind of Euro elements, which is, on your turn, you take an action, you've got four strips on this board, each one represents an action. You can take one action, and then the next turn, you can't take that action again, you've got to take one of the other three actions. So you've got a very limited choice of actions, but for each panel, there's one thing you can do at the top, and another thing potentially you can do at the bottom. Uh, typically the top thing's fairly easy to do and might get you some stuff. The one at the bottom you've often got to spend resources to do, so you're not often doing that. Um, but this, just the, that thought process of, of, I really want the top action here, but the bottom action here would be great, oh, but I need resources for that, which I get from this other panel. It's like, ah, which panel do I use? Which action do I take? And then you add on top of that um, the kind of board exploration. As I like the um, the adventures. I yeah. they're not much of an adventure, but you kind of go to a certain location. That's right. And you draw this big card. And they give you some choices. It's like you meet a small um, rabble of <laughs> children running around or something. Do you A do this or B do that? And typically, some actions. Uh, one key resource, I suppose, in the game is popularity. And some actions will increase your popularity, but you don't get much stuff for it. Other actions, you get lots of stuff, but then everybody hates you for it. You can just steal all of their resources. Like, well, I've got this stuff, but then your popularity really takes a dive. The factions are great, then, because each of the factions feels very different. Um, and you have a different kind of hero that runs around. Uh, and the boards have different layouts and things, which is really interesting. Um, but then the point scoring is very Euro-y. So you're kind of multiplying your popularity by the number of so the number of territories on the map at the yeah. end, isn't it? It's the number, the number of stars of, you've completed. Yeah. yeah, which are kind of victory point objectives, if yeah. you like. So you kind of get one star for getting all your mechs out, one star for winning two battles, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's that kind of thing. Uh, and then it's resources as well, I think. Isn't it? Every two resources. Yeah. yeah. So 
you need a kind of mix of all sorts of things, but it's a really strong engine building game, I think. Really like it. It's a game I'm always happy to play. I've played it loads. Um, yeah, my argument in my video why it wasn't in my top 30 was it feels samey the more I play it. And I think I'm starting to feel like I haven't played it as much as you, but I still really enjoy it. But that's the only reason it's dropped slightly, I think. I think, I think that is fair. I think it probably is. I think the expansion Rise of Fenris meant to mix up a little bit, but I haven't actually seen it. <laughs> I've not played yeah, it yet. Indeed. So that's so talking about that, that's probably not fair. Um, yeah, I've not. I'm surprised I've seen it was played less than I expected to, considering the popularity. I it, have seen it played. It got played a lot when yeah. it first came out. But and when the first expansion came out, it was still really high. But the yeah. like the airships, I haven't seen around. I've seen it played once. The airships. Yeah, I think it's my copy of it. Was it yours? Is it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Rise of Fenris, I think they're playing on Sunday morning at the capital. They're playing as so. a campaign. Yeah. Ah. Oh, is it a legacy thing? You open boxes, but you don't have to. You can just play it with us. Ah. You can go. I'm going to open it all and use all of them. Because <laughs> or, or you can play through and go I'll open one at a time and then. Okay. But in, you still can integrate them in a standard gang. So. It's it kind of is. It's a very good game. It doesn't yeah. need an expansion. The game itself is very good. I just, yeah, I know. I kind of do the same thing every time. So, <laughs> but you normally win every time, don't yeah. you? Well, why, why would you deviate? <laughs> Number thirteen. This next one again is another replacement, and that's because the third edition of Arkham Horror has been released this year. Although, rather strangely, it's actually dropped a little bit because, again, this was in my top 10 last year. Now, I'm trying to figure out why that is, and I think it's because with the second edition, which I played a lot, I actually played it far more solo than anything else. I rarely solo games, but this is just one of those that captured my imagination. I kind of, there was a YouTube, like a playlist or a video that someone had done. In fact, I think it was Tristan Hall who did this, but he um, sort of put together this 20s kind of jazz music that fits the era perfectly, uh, combined with kind of monster sounds and thunder and lightning, and it was super atmospheric and fantastic. I'm sure if you search for it on YouTube, you'll find it like an Arkham Horror soundtrack. But I used to set this up and play it with the soundtrack going and really got into it and played it and played it and played it and had a great time with it. Um, I played the third edition with other people. I've not played it solo. And with other people, it feels... I don't know why, quite why, but it, I didn't enjoy it quite as much. I still really enjoyed it. It's still a fantastic game, and the third edition is definitely better than the second edition. So I'd highly recommend it. I think maybe I just need to play the third edition. You know, the thumbs down you just gave us then. Is it? Thumbs down now for everybody. <laughs> yes. The, um, it's, it takes a lot of the things, the third edition takes a lot of things from the second edition. The, one of the problems with the second edition was it was so long and rather clunky, but this streamlines it all really well while still retaining the theme. I think the issue with Eldritch Horror, which came out after Arkham Horror, was although it streamlined it, it kind of lost some of the theme with the world map and just randomly going to different locations around the world. The third edition of Arkham Horror does a great job of taking the small mm. town of Arkham, keeping all yeah. the theme, and streamlining it as well. Because uh, we played this together and we yeah. had a blast with it. It's a really, really good game. Um, but... I surprisingly liked it more than I expected to, which I thought it yep. was, I'd hoped to be an improvement. And... Because it's taking stuff like the theme, the theme from Eldritch Horror with the you playing to a specific plot, which I know can limit it to some extent, because once you've seen that plot, you've kind of seen it. But then yeah. in Arkham Horror, the second edition, I'm fighting this bad guy. It made no difference to the game yes. whatsoever. Yeah. So at least that's in there. But I was surprised once you realise how some things happened, how it's stolen a bit from Pandemic, with the refreshing of yes, that's right. ticked in, in, in our case, with stuff appearing on the board they would cycle through based on the bag. So we knew that generally if stuff was going to be here, it would, it would keep reappearing here, which is very pandemic X. Yeah. So one of the really nice yeah. things is in the old version, Doom would appear on this track. And if Doom of Doom came out, the old one awakens and typically yeah. much you lose the game unless you're very good at fighting. But in this one, it doesn't appear on a track. It appears all over the map of Arkham and you have to kind of run around mm. fighting it. But as Mark says, the areas where the Doom starts to appear, more Doom tends to appear in the same areas because of the way you shuffle the deck. Um, and that worked really well. We found we've kept having to go back and fight the old, you know, we've just cleared out this area and now there's more Doom there again. And I really like that. It was um, great fun. You've not, I've not it. played it. I've <laughs> yeah. not played any of the editions, I'm afraid. It's not, they're just the time length, the yeah, length of long. time yeah. puts me off, I'm afraid. Yeah, I can see that. Number 12. 
This next one is in a very similar position to last year and it's one of the escape the room type games uh, and we've had a blast with uh, all the different sorts of escape the room games that have been coming out because there have been quite a few now haven't there? Um, and this particular oh, one is, <laughs> is Unlock. Uh, it's not my favourite of the escape the room games, there's another one appearing a bit later. Um, but Unlock does a great job and to be honest there's not a great deal between them. Uh, Unlock does it with a series of cards, you kind of place the cards in the middle and depending on where the positions are it's like a, you're looking at like a plan view of a room and different items come out and you combine the cards in different ways. So kind of a blue jigsaw piece will fit with the red jigsaw piece because of the way the shapes work. Um, but it does all the things that an escape room game does very well I think. It uses an app which is nice, so you have a couple of puzzles you can potentially be solving on the app. The app does a, like a countdown timer, which sort of limits you by the time. I think it's probably the only thing that makes this one slightly lower than the other Escape the Room choice on my list, which is that it's just quite stressful <laughs> because the time keeps running out. Every time you, you can try and solve these different puzzles and you type a particular code into the app, which you think is the solution, and you go, <laughs> and you lose two minutes of time. It's like, oh my goodness, we've only got 10 minutes left. we just lost two minutes. And so I uh, just get a bit worked up playing this one. Um, but it's still a great game, and if you haven't tried any Escape the Room games, I would um, recommend this one as much as any of them. It's fantastic. They're great. I mean, people complain. The one complaint is that you can only play them once, but uh, if you go to real life Escape the Room games, which we've done, uh, yeah. and they're great, you're paying like a third of the price to do it from a box. Yeah. If you buy Unlock, you usually get in, in the UK anyway, you get like three or three games in one. Um, and the price you're paying for that is like a third of the Escape the Room game for four people or something, a real life one. And Unlock's resellable, yeah. ultimately. Oh, oh you, yeah, can which give, is, gift yeah, yeah, on, you can so. gift it. I think it's very good. The app, you know, you, you, you can't get stuck. The app will uh, help you out when you're stuck. Yeah, the you hints can, are nice. You can get hints on the app and eventually you'll, you ask enough hints, you'll get it there. It'll take you for your score and we generally avoid the hints, but... Like, we played one of the older Escape the Room games mm. where the hints just weren't up to scratch. You had, like, yeah. three hints, but we were, on the, we were on completely the wrong path, and the first hint didn't put us back on the right path. Um, so we were, we were shot, I'm afraid. We spent, like, half an hour over the time, and we still didn't solve it because we just were stuck. Well, we, so, ha we have the result. How to, we have, here's, here's the solution. Well, and we didn't understand how you got to the solution, yeah, and the, that doesn't make sense. I mean, that was partly our own fault. We missed yeah. something, but uh, in the, the better Escape the Room games, there isn't that mm. dilemma. You don't get stuck like that. They've been well play-tested, I think, because yeah. you really need to see how different groups are going to interact with the different puzzles and where they're going to go wrong and what sort of mistakes yeah. they might make. Um, but yeah, the unlock is very streamlined. In interesting. I play-tested a real-life Escape the Room. I mm. went into one of the demo groups for one of the first rooms, yep. and the guy who designed it walked walked with us and he was just sat there behind us and <laughs> the very first thing we got to was a metal gate and we went to the gate and we shook it and we're like, okay fine we can't get through and it was a really tiny room there was four of us plus him in this really tiny room and we're looking for there's not much around here we've got these po poking things in the walls and he just kept saying what's blocking your way like, it's the gate but it won't open <laughs> 15 minutes later the side of the gate opened <laughs> The main gate was stuck, but it was a little side gate. Ah, okay. <laughs> took us 15 minutes to spot that, so obviously I think they went and changed that because they can't have the first part stump you. Uh, that was quite a nice experience. Number 11. And the next one is Exit, which is the other Escape the Room game. So all the reasons why we you know, enjoy the Unlock game so much is equally true for Exit. The big difference with this one is the game is destructible, I think they call it, which effectively means you're potentially cutting or folding or tearing or sticking different parts of the game together. And that adds an extra dimension. To be honest, it doesn't make a huge difference to me. I think it probably makes more difference to you, doesn't it? But it, um, it means the ingenuity sometimes of the puzzles it's just that little bit yeah. more interesting than unlock. I think there's more scope to yeah. do stuff when you can draw on it, and you can, and it'll tell you yeah. to draw a line here, then here. Oh, it's a number eight, and yeah, and you get that. I mean, you can possibly visualize it without drawing on it, but you've just got more. That they can do exactly what they do in unlock, yeah, and extra stuff. I think. Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, I was thinking like they must have really play tested that though, because ultimately yeah. in that, I in theory could destroy this in a way that prevents me completing the puzzle. And yet, in all the ones we've done, that's never been an issue. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, last hint is the solution. Yeah, hint, hint, yeah, solution. yeah, true. But even so, it's playing. We've never had to point where I've gone. Oh, we can't. We couldn't do it because earlier somebody tore up something in the wrong way. Yeah. I think we're very careful before we yeah. tear or rip things. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, 
But um, still, yeah. we could have yeah, quite easily just gone down the wrong path. We've never done that. I think they're very good at that. I think um, you can't go wrong in exit. Apart from apart from that, mm. I think you can't uncover a card you've not got access to. The wheel thing is nice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You so have to you have to solve two. There's still going to be two concurrent things. You've got to solve the puzzle, check the wheel for the right bit, yeah. and there's two different things that could. If one of them goes wrong, you won't get. An, you'll say no, no, you won't get a card. Um, whereas in lock, we've had uh, at least one and a half times where we've gone out of order and it wrecked the puzzle for us. Especially you can accidentally get the solution to something else. In a yeah, sense, we think, we? well, maybe, 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 we've had, maybe it's 82. Is that 82? 82? Oh, it's a card. Yeah, okay, let's have a go. And then you're, you're out of place in the story. Because in Lock's got a story as well. Um, ruins it. But yeah, um, I think uh, we all agree Exit's best, do we? Yeah, yeah. I think ultimately Exit has had more shock moments that when that was that was well done yeah. or something like that yeah. unlocks they've tapered out more I'd say yeah. but we'll see there'll be, there'll be new ones coming out unlock is a little bit more thematic the thing about the exit games that amazes me though is we, we play them as soon as they come out and every single one does something new and original it's like surely they will have run out of ideas by now <laughs> but then it's like oh my goodness I wasn't expecting that so they've done a great job with that and I hope they continue to do we had the, the last one we played, Jonathan picked out, picked out an item from the box and goes, oh look, it's one of those things that you get in those places. And then for the rest of the game, we forgot about it. But, but, <laughs> but he spotted the puzzle right away. He spotted, oh yeah, I mean, near the end, we'll have, we'll have to use this for something. We didn't, we didn't think about it. And in the we end, we were stuck. Yeah. Ten minutes ago, actually, you remember what I said earlier? And then, <laughs> go without spoiling the issue. So, there we go. That was 20 down to 11. Um, thoughts? On choices in that one? There's a lot of new games, I think. Yeah, there were. New things. Out, like, yeah. Within the last few years, you've got the new Arkham Horror, the new Nirishima Hex, which I've forgotten the name Mama of. Mongoth Arena, Agra, Rogers of Ganges. Yeah, Western Legends. Yeah. Go 56, 60%. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Games new, new games or replacements? Yes, indeed. Yes. So, yeah. 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 Um, you, do you think you're gaming more now than you were? Hmm, that's a good question. Yes, I think I am. Okay. Because I, I think I'm gaming less than I was a few years ago. Okay. Uh, Do you think you're playing games less, a fewer numbers of times? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That's the. I get a lot of new games coming through. Yeah. And we play them a bit, and we film the video usually. Um, but then there's something else comes along. Like, oh, we need to play yeah. this for now, and we play this a bunch, and then we film it. So yeah, there's certainly a lot of games. So in fact, there aren't many games that I will keep coming back to and playing. But those are the ones that tend to then sit in my top 30, I think. Mm. All right. Well, uh, do let me know in the comments below what you think of the choices. Uh, there's just 10 left, though. So uh, the final stretch, 10 down to 1, will be in the next video. Uh, so do tune in for that. Uh, please like and subscribe if you haven't done already. It makes a big difference to us. Uh, thank you very much for watching. My name is Jonathan Hicks. Good evening. I'm Marvin. See you next time. Bye.